Inside Albania with me, Alice Taylor. This week, I am joined by the creative genius behind the film Alexander, Albania's entries to next year's Oscars, as well as not one but two MEPs to discuss the recent debate in European Parliament on Kosovo and Serbia. I'll also be talking about AI and its place in the world of media and journalism with two of my colleagues, one who's flesh and blood and the other who is not. Let's get started. This week saw the ongoing situation between Kosovo and Serbia debated in the European Parliament. On the initiative of the Greens EFA group, a debate was organised to discuss the 24th September terrorist attack and what should happen next from an EU level. I'm joined in the studio once again by Greens MEP and Rapporteur for Kosovo, Viola von Kramen, to get an overview of what happened in the debate and what happens next. Viola, there was a debate in European Parliament during which you, along with others, made calls for more action from the EU regarding Kosovo and Serbia. You called specifically for the lifting of sanctions against Kosovo and a tougher stance towards Serbia. Can you give our viewers a brief overview of the mood in the session yesterday and any of the other suggestions which were put on the table? Well, overall, I would say there's quite a big worry uh, about the stability in the Western Balkan, about the security, about the threats uh, coming especially from, from Serbia, but also the, the lack of political will to find solutions. And I think it was crystal clear that at that point, the patient with, uh, with Serbia, with the President Vucic, uh, was rather limited. Uh, I think it was rather clear that uh, there will be um, appropriate, uh, uh, I wouldn't call that sanctions, because sanctions means you have a sanction regime, it needs to be approved by the council. This is not uh, the case in the, uh, uh, for Kosovo and this won't be the case for Serbia. So we speak about measures, we speak about some political financial measures, uh, we speak about uh, limited access maybe to EPA fund, which would definitely um, uh, harm uh, the government of, of, of Serbia. Uh, we speak about other measures, but not about sanctions. Neither are there any sanctions for Kosovo at the moment. The mood was rather clear. We want an, um, uh, we want an accession process uh, for both countries, for all the countries of the Western Balkan but it's a merit-based process. And if one country um, <clears throat> creates this uh, military um, and almost a terrorist attack in the neighboring country, this hard to understand how a country would become a member of the European Union. So um, imagine that uh, President Vucic is quite, um, I would say, uh, in control of uh, most of the activities in uh, in Serbia, it is hard to imagine that he was not aware of what's going on uh, in in terms of buying this military equipment, putting together this uh, this group of attackers and so on and so forth. So it's now in his hands to make sure there's a proper investigation, uh, that there's a proper prosecution, uh, there's a lot of transparency of what actually went how and. Uh, how could this happen? That is in his hands. And I guess that many people yesterday, but also in the commission before in the European External Action Service made sure that this message is also uh, received uh, the president of Serbia. Now, last week I interviewed uh, Donika Gavela Schwartz and I've heard from other stakeholders that they feel like they've been warning the West and the EU about the risk of this kind of attack for some time but that the response from the EU has very much been, uh, you know, we don't believe you, and this is what they feel. Are people perhaps waking up to the reality of the situation in Kosovo a bit more now after what happened? Well, I, I think we need clarity. And uh, one side who could help uh, to deliver this or to provide us with clarity would be the Serbian side. And so that's why we have asked uh, to give us the facts. Uh, so what happened? How could this 
armed vehicles and heavy um, military equipment end up in the north of Kosovo? Who is behind that? What kind of organized gangs? What kind of criminal uh, networks are still uh, hosted there in the north of Kosovo? Whether this is really orchestrated by the uh, Serbian state or as uh, Milan Ridojevic uh, said, it was his uh, own responsibility, his sole uh, responsibility. I mean, we have no clarity uh, whatsoever. Still, I would say that Serbia has no interest in a bigger military attack. I don't think Serbia has an interest in the um, in any kind of a war. That is at least what I would see from how people react uh, in Belgrade. But obviously, uh, many things went wrong and the stability is um, in danger. Uh, there is the risk that one provocation uh, initiated another provocation and this needs to be prevented. And that is why myself, but also some other colleagues, ask uh, K4 uh, to increase the troops uh, to make sure that there is uh, enough resilient, that there is enough robust forces. Uh, UK uh, stated this example. I think that was very helpful, immediately sent some additional troops. And I hope that Germany and other member states will follow this example. Now, another thing I want to know, were there any opposing voices or rather those that were maybe a bit more pro-Serbian? Um, and if so, who and what were their stances? Well, interesting enough, uh, I was actually wondering, but I did not hear any so-called defenders of uh, the, the Serbian voice. I wouldn't call this, this is the pro or anti or whatsoever voices. I would rather say that everyone is very much alerted on what was happening on the 24th of September. Uh, and everyone is very much committed on we would like to see a solution and the solution means we need to have the first steps uh, settled before we go back to business as usual. Uh, and there is a lot, I think, where the Serbian government, where President Vucic, where the authorities and Belgrade has have to help. And uh, that was made crystal clear by everyone. So nobody really spoke in favor and defended uh, the Serbian, I would say, behavior. This day of mourning, uh, the rhetoric towards Kosovo, uh, the, the um, yellow press and all the pressure coming against the uh, ethnic um, Albanians and so on. Nobody ever, uh, not ever, but nobody defended this in the yesterday's uh, um, session. Which brings me on to the next question. What happens now? I mean, do you think there is enough support within the EU institutions to take concrete action and to crack down on Serbia? Well, for sure, uh, there is a request uh, from the Commission uh, and uh, from the EU institution to give us, uh, as I said before, the clarity to um, have a proper uh, prosecution now against those people who are behind the attacks. And if the cooperation of the government of Serbia, uh, the authorities, the judiciary, if this cooperation is sufficient, there might be a chance that there will be no uh, measures, but for sure, uh, the measures are drafted now. The measures can be politically, the measures can be financially, uh, the measures can be in terms of the negotiations, the accession negotiations, and so on. So they are, we have a lot of uh, tools in our hands, and we know that is definitely not in the interest of President Vucic, while he has actually already announced uh, elections in December, uh, to see that things slip out of his hands. Uh, therefore, we do hope that uh, we see, I would say, a constructive attitude uh, and also a step-by-step -step approach. Regarding Kosovo, of course, it is in our interest that at some point um, we will 
come back uh, to a constructive way of the dialogue. But only, as I said, after Serbia has done the, how, uh, the homework on what happened on the 24th of uh, September. There's no question about that. Um, but nevertheless, um, we would like to see, before we actually start the pre-election campaign of the European Parliament and on the US election, to get things done and to finalize, uh, especially also the questions about uh, the ORID agreement, um, the association of the Serb municipalities and so on. And what I understand is that many diplomatic forces are now putting together another proposal, how we're gonna proceed. What details might uh, entail this, I can't tell you at the moment. Could we be seeing a more balanced approach with that proposal? Well, it depends what you call balance. But, uh, well, I mean, Serbia has definitely ruined everything they could ruin. So for the moment, I don't see that there is anyone um, waiting for, I mean, everyone is waiting for uh, Serbia to deliver. And the next thing is then uh, that after we have seen um, uh, the handling of uh, the uh, attacks in hopefully a reasonable way, uh, then I guess we need to see the right step towards the dialogue. Yes, and hopefully this will be, I mean, called a balance or on the other hand, um, at least you need to see the political will. And uh, I do hope that the European Union would also firstly ask from President Vucic to sign the agreement to make sure he is not just talking about that, but he also delivers with his signature. Otherwise, it would be hard to believe here for us in the European Parliament, in the European institution, but also in Kosovo, that he has a genuine interest uh, to get something out of the dialogue. In parallel, and this is important to say, we also need the commitment for the association of the Serb municipalities. There's no question about that. So yes, the signature means business. And on the other hand, what was signed from the Kosovo side in 2013 and 2015 needs then to be uh, finalized as well. Now, in my interview with Gavala Schwartz last week, she also told me that following the attack in the north and alleged plans to annex it completely from Kosovo, this brings a new context to Serbia's demands for the Association of Serbian Municipalities, also echoed by the EU. Do you think that the creation, the structure and the function of this association should be looked at differently in this new context? I have not heard these voices that this is... Um interrelated. So um, I have no indication that there was a bigger annexation plan. Um, as I said, uh, let's look into the fact for the next days and weeks to come. Let's make sure that we get from you, Lex, from the uh, services, from the intelligence, uh, from the different partners, um, information they have on hand uh, and put this together uh, and then decide. But so far, I would be very cautious with any um, immediate, um, I would say, assumptions. Viola, thank you very much for your time. I am joined online today by Dutch MEP Thies Ruiten from the Socialists and Democrats, the second largest group in European Parliament, to find out more about the debate this week. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to join me on Inside Albania. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. Uh, now, I understand um, out of yesterday's debate, there were some calls to lift some of the measures against Kosovo and potentially enforce some on Serbia following the incident on the 24th of September. I wanted to get a feeling from you. What was the mood in Parliament yesterday? Was there any opposition to these sort of suggestions? Was there any hesitance? Well, no, I, I, I can say that the vast majority of the Parliament was very, very critical on the approach of the European Union so far, because despite uh, months and months of widespread criticism from the European Parliament, 
the EU so far only managed to put sanctions on Kosovo instead of going after the aggressor, the cause, the root cause of the destabilization and the provocations that we have seen now uh, for, so, for so long. So there was nobody really saying, oh, you know, maybe we need to take a more balanced approach or maybe Serbia, we need to wait more for fact or anything like that. It was quite definite that things need to be tougher. Well, there, there might have been one or two MEPs uh, that uh, struck uh, that uh, tone, but the general mood among all the major political groups was that we now need to leave this course of appeasement of President uh, Vucic because it's not working. Mm -hmm. It's only um, emboldening uh, him in his, um, uh, in his efforts to keep the situation unstable and to keep on uh, provoking time and time again using his pattern of escalation then to de-escalate. We need to get rid of that. Yes. Was there any mention um, regarding the work of the mediators in the process, so Miroslav Lajak and Joseph Borrell? Well, the, the, uh, the problem is that um, as long as the uh, process is now where it is, namely um, uh, on hold, uh, we cannot do uh, a lot. And also the, the, the mediators are um, uh, a little bit um, uh, in, in, um, in uh, jeopardy in that uh, respect. Um, yes, of course, I agree that at some point we need to get around the table, but it has to be a um, conversation in good faith. And if there has been an attack that uh, um, quite probably has been uh, receiving support from within Serbia, an attack on a police officer, a police officer died, uh, there were a massive amount of weapons uh, in Kosovo, smuggled into Kosovo, probably to do even more uh, of this type of destabilizing uh, actions, then we cannot just um, uh, go around the table uh, uh, business as usual. That is why the European Union has to um, uh, come with measures, has to ask for a full investigation into what happened. And uh, to be fair, uh, the fact that um, uh, the possible uh, suspect uh, the, of the perpetrator of the, of the attack has been released the day after his arrest is not a good sign at all. And I also want to hear the European Union about that. I want to hear uh, a, 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 step, a point of view from the European Union when it comes to these kind of, um, of events. Um, now, what happens next in the parliamentary process? There, uh, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, there will be a resolution in a couple of weeks. And is there anything we can expect from the EU institution side between yesterday's debate and the um, upcoming resolution? I think that the uh, European Parliament will come up with a, a very um, tough resolution, a resolution also setting out uh, several wishes that we want uh, the European Union institutions, namely the Member States and the Commission, uh, to follow up uh, on. And it's good that we have a little bit more time. The resolution will be voted in two weeks uh, from now, uh, so we have a little bit of time to, to prepare that. And um, for me, and I think for many others in, um, uh, in, the, in the European Parliament, and certainly my group, um, everything that happened, not only in the past week, but also in all the months after the Ohrid Agreement, because we have seen a long list of provocations, the attack on Kiev for soldiers, the abduction of police officers in uh, Kosovo. Uh, we need to, uh, um, to create a um, situation where, eventually, people can uh, sit around the table again to work on normalization. But we cannot do, after all these provocations, business as usual. The European Union has to leave the uh, disastrous um, politics of appeasement. Um, now, moving on to something else slightly. Uh, Russia has openly supported Serbia following the terrorist attack. Uh, is this, along with a growing influence of Russia and Serbia and closeness between the two countries, and subsequent destabilization in the Balkans. Is this of concern? Was this brought up during yesterday's debate? Yes, as it has been brought up in the past uh, past year, I would say one and a half year, because it is still a big problem that Serbia is not supporting the sanctions against Russia because of the war of aggression. It is a big problem that security officers, ministers of the cabinet of President Vucic still travel to Moscow. It is still a problem that President Vucic, the day after uh, the events in the north of Kosovo, has a meeting with the Russian ambassador simply to provoke us, to show 
uh, to the European Union that he does not take it serious. And that has to change. I want to say also, and I want to um, uh, emphasize that that has to change in the interest of the Serbian people, because it is in the interest of the Serbian people and also the Serbians in North Kosovo that he is holding hostage, in my opinion, that he will change course and that the European Union and the international partners uh, will be strict and tough on him. My last question, I know you don't have much time. Um, you mentioned the word appeasement and it's something I agree with, but why, why do you think, in a nutshell, the European Union and Commission um, is or has been appeasing Serbia in their approach towards the situation? Well, my, my honest answer is that I don't know. Uh, because if I look at what happened, and I will uh, limit myself to the last half year, then I see that everything we've tried, every time that Mr. Vucic, for example, returned from Brussels to Belgrade and, and, and was proud that he didn't sign anything and that he co didn't commit to anything, uh, a couple of days later, uh, Commissioner Vaheli shows up with 600 million euros. I do simply not understand uh, the logic uh, behind uh, that. And I think it does not work, because if it would have worked, we would have seen uh, a different situation uh, now. But it is clear that with autocrats, who are only interested in one thing, appeasement is not the way to go. Dears, thank you very much for your time, and thank you for your voice in European Parliament on this matter as well. Wednesday, Tirana saw the premiere of Alexander, a film by Ardit Sadiku, which will be Albania's entry to the 2024 Oscars. Born out of a desire to bring to light stories of human struggle for freedom, Alexander delves into a pivotal moment in history when Alexander Gruder and his friends devised a daring plan to steal a warship and escape their totalitarian regime. Facing the wrath of mortar guns, helicopters and machine gun fire, the group set sail risking everything for a chance of a life of political freedom. I'm joined in the studio today by Ardid to find out a bit more. Good afternoon, welcome to Inside Albania. Good afternoon and uh, I'm glad and thank you for the invitation. Now I want to start first with your story for our viewers who might not be familiar with you and your work. So you're Albanian, you're from Skodra, right, I believe. Right. Yes, my favorite city. Um, can you Explain a bit about your path to where you are today. How did you get into filmmaking? What motivates you? What's your goals? Right, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I started as a teenager making short films and uh, from there I went on making a feature film. I made my first feature film when I was uh, 26 and, uh, and uh, from there I started making feature films in fiction and uh, in the recent years I started to explore the documentary form and uh, I've made three feature films and two documentary films, and the recent documentary film being Alexander. But what, I mean, how old were you when you thought, I want to make films? You know, what, what was it that sent you in this direction? Uh, I was around 16 years old. Uh, I was also playing clarinet because I studied clarinet in high school. And I, I loved visual arts and I loved cameras and I loved all these equipments and I really wanted to make films. I didn't know how to start and how to make them, but my objective was to make films until I learned the craft and uh, until I can make better films and improve and improve with each film, basically. Do you still play the clarinet? Sometimes I do, actually. <laughs> it's a beautiful instrument. Uh, it's good for classical music, and uh, yes. but I forgot how to play clarinet because of now I play the camera. <laughs> uh, I, I used to play the, the violin and the, the piano and my mum tells me, you don't play the violin anymore, that money I spent on your lessons and blah blah blah. And I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. I'm sorry mum, but you know, I have other things to do now. Um, so the next question, obviously, the story of Alexander um, for those and our foreign guests, our foreign uh, viewers amongst us, can you explain a bit about the story, um, how you decided to pursue this story for the film and what viewers can expect when they watch it? Uh, Alexander is a story about uh, eternal struggle for freedom. And, uh, and Alexander took action in a very heroic fashion, hijacking a warship in the middle of the day with his friends and family and uh, escaping to former Yugoslavia. And uh, 
the story it's it's about freedom it's not all about communism because it happened during a communism but since i was born in democracy i wanted to focus more on the just the hijack plan and uh, how crazy it can be to hijack a warship so that was my main interest in the story was a man who hijacks a warship and escapes his country it was something i never heard before and I thought it's great for a cinematic Albanians experience. Albanians don't do things by halves, do they? Right. Like, I'm not going to sneak across the border. I'm going to steal a warship. Right. And it's, <laughs> it was crazy. When I heard it, I thought this is my next film. And how did you come across the story? I mean, just to explain for our viewers as well. Was this something well known or was it something you unearthed? Al Alexander is a celebrity in Shkodr for this act, actually, among his generation. Mm -hmm. The new generation doesn't talk much because... Uh, we had enough of the communist stories and uh, maybe the foreign audience find it uh, more exotic to yeah. talk about uh, Albanian history than we do sometimes. And uh, the story, I heard the story many times from uh, people, his friends, and, uh, and I asked them, how can I contact Alexander? And I got his phone number and I called him. And he told me, oh, this is not possible. It happened 33 years ago. Like, how can we do it? Are you finding actors? No, I said, you will be my actor. Ah. But how can I be an actor? I don't know how to act, he said. But uh, you don't have to act. You it's just your have story. To, you just have you to be it. yourself, yeah. right? You lift it. And it's interesting because uh, when I went to New York and he didn't expect it and he opened the door and he started laughing. He didn't believe I was there and because I had his address before. And then I told him we're flying to Albania. I booked your flight. And we flew to Albania to make the movie, the documentary. And uh, But interesting enough is that this story happened 33 years ago. And when he was in that revisiting the same locations from where he escaped, it felt like he was living that same moment again. Wow. The emotions were very raw, very mm -hmm. real. I've had this before, actually. I did a series of documentaries interviewing people on their family members who were missing from communism. And I interviewed people who remember them. And for many of them, it was the first time they talked about it, you know. And we went to the the places where they used to live. And I, I know they sort of reverted into how they remembered it. And it was a very emotional thing. But it, it sounds like he didn't really have much of a say in whether he was taking part in it. You just sort of turned up at his house. <laughs> I've booked you a flight. Come on, let's go. Right. <laughs> and, and in that same way, I also went to Australia because... Uh, his best friend, his, uh, the person who helped him to uh, neutralize the soldiers because they kidnapped four soldiers. That was the only way to yeah. hijack the warship. And uh, I went to Australia and, uh, and this guy was very interesting because uh, he did so many things uh, in that story, but he's very, he has no ego at all. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to talk about himself. He's just very happy with himself. Very strong character. And so now Alexander has been selected to be Albania's entry for the Oscars. Um, my first question, how did this come about, the process for this? And what was Alexander's reaction when you said, you know, you've been sort of submitted to the Oscars, big international, you know, the biggest film awards in the world? Right. So the uh, Albanian National Center of Cinema Cinematography funded the film and uh, they do have a commission they appoint a commission of five members. To, uh, it's a board that uh, votes for the films that will represent Albania. And there were a few films submitted, and that's how it goes. Like There is a vote process, mm -hmm. and uh, they vote for the film that will represent Albania in the Oscars 2024. And they do this each year, actually. And we've been sending films each year. It's a good thing for the film. It's a good film for my career. Uh, I don't want to think about it that much, because I, I, if, if there's a good news, I will welcome it, you know? And, uh, but uh, the film entered in uh, international, uh, international feature film, which is uh, the category we submitted, mm -hmm. but it was also qualified to and eligible to enter in documentary feature film, so it entered two categories. So we have the, two chances. Uh, two chances. Yeah. But what did Alexander say when you told him? Yes, and uh, I told Alexander, and he said, I, d I didn't believe this, I can't believe <laughs> this. Because I thought this will be a very small film, he yeah, said. Yeah. It was you with your camera and a very small crew. Like, how did this happen? Are you joking? And then I sent him uh, some news, <laughs> some some links, and he was very excited. Um, and where he works, he works at the Trump uh, condominium, condominium mm -hmm. center. And uh, all his uh, co-workers want to see this movie. Like yeah, everyone, he's telling me everyone is coming to see me. Hi, movie star, they call him. And now he's a celebrity uh, there. Yeah. <laughs> And you had the premiere in Tirana this week. Um, what has been, and 
as I've written before, you premiered it at DocuFest in, in Kosovo. Um, what has the reaction been from people? Uh, the world premiere was in Dokofest, in uh, the beautiful city of Prizren. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reaction was very good and the attendance was uh, great because it screened twice and uh, uh, I like the reactions of the people. And uh, sometimes they would laugh, sometimes they would cry, sometimes they had all these mixed emotions that... Uh, it, ha it hasn't been the case in all of my films, but it has been the case of Alexander, mm -hmm. actually. As long as they're crying and laughing for the right reasons. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, for the right reason, because uh, Alexander is a very charismatic person. Yes. He makes you laugh, but he also makes you cry. I mean, his personal, he's also a very emotional person, and it really, um, it, it kind of touches all the people. Mm -hmm. And my last question for you, what's next? You ha you, you're definitely working on something else, so I'm sure of it. What's next? Yes, you know very well, actually. <laughs> uh, next is a feature film. It's a fiction film i cannot talk about the story yet but uh, i'm still working and working any on tiny project. hint or clue at all you can give us a tiny hint a tiny hint about what it's about um good question maybe it's a surprise better <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, like, I like i like i like to uh, to say i just completed the shooting and then <laughs> When okay, so when can we expect your next project mm, to be made public? Probably next year. Okay, yes. that that will have to do for now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best for the Oscar, um, the, the situation with the Oscars, and I very much look forward to seeing what you have next for us. Thank you very much Thank for your you. invitation. Thanks. <laughs> Euronews Albania has become a trailblazer by becoming one of the only handful of media companies in the world and the first in Albania that has introduced AI into the world of television. This week, we welcomed a new member of our team at Euronews Albania, Tokyo Tirana, an AI newsreader who will read some of the news starting on the Good Morning Albanians morning show. Tokyo Tirana has no need for hair and makeup, a teleprompter or a full technical team. Rather, she exists virtually and is fed with a script that she then reads in full to the audience. But I have quite a lot of questions about this, and to help me answer them and hopefully explain it to you as well, I invited my colleague, Jaron Tachi, into my very real studio. Hello, Hello. welcome Hello. to Inside Albania. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, I just passed my A2 Albanian language exam, and it was very difficult, and I'm wondering, how on earth did we manage to teach um, an AI entity the Albanian language? And is it relatively easy to teach other AI entities different languages? Yes, it's fairly easy now because uh, AI, as you told and I was hearing you, it's like just getting visual, but it was everything there. Now, at this moment, uh, AI found a way to communicate with us. And the way to communicate is the language. And uh, what it can do, it can translate you in real time in another language and even move your lips as you are talking the other language. So I think for the humanity will be not anymore a, pr a problem to learn a different language because it will automatically translate it. But how does she learn it? How does she learn it? Well, there are several processes about that mm -hmm. because there is something to be explained into artificial intelligence the term artificial intelligence really is like an umbrella who covers a lot of mini processes and a lot of technology which has evolved in these 15 years so by comparing the words by comparing the meaning by uh, the having access to a lot of information online and we feed the artificial intelligence model to learn a language and then we feed maybe another network to to learn something else and then we compare it together and they find the meaning and do the translation so this is something that uh, i try to explain it in in human words but to turn that into ai would be a lot of time to to explain it but I think it will be very easy for somebody to translate and even to talk in another language, in many languages, many 200 languages. But this, I mean, I'm learning a language and I take a lot of pride in progressing and yeah. getting better by having AI sort of be able to remove the need for someone to learn a language. I mean, that's yeah. taking away a bit of our humanity in a way, isn't it? 
Why? <laughs> because you, you want to learn a language, you put effort into it, you know, there's that personal sense of accomplishment, of achievement. Maybe. Will people stop learning languages and just For use For me, it AI? never was, for example. <laughs> you know, I, I speak like two languages, plus Albanian three, and like I just have to, to learn it. And for me, artificial intelligence is something that I put my mind at ease because I think that, okay, now I can correct myself. Ah. Uh, on it and I can do just the script in one language and it will turn it into another one. So Tokyo Tirana, for example, has been fed with lots of other information about in Albanian language. She's, in Albanian she's language. listened to people speaking Albanian to No, it's not like that. How how does she know? Because her pronunciation was better than mine. Oh uh, <laughs> well, it's like emotionless for the moment and the idea is that uh, we 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 put data into Albanian language to the uh, artificial intelligence mm. and uh, the artificial intelligence moves the face uh, by talking in Albanian the words that we have written to read mm. the model okay it's it's a difficult concept for me to get my head around in a way um, so it's like a visual effects based on text but the sound as well Yes, the voice, you can take any voice. Yes. And, 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 and make it so, uh, for example, uh, what I was telling you a little bit earlier is that I can uh, take your voice and make you speak in any language. Yes. Now, this is something I'm going to come to yeah. in a minute, actually. Um, but what, in the context of media, like broadcast media in particular, what benefit does having something like Tokyo Tirana bring to a newsroom? Uh, as I told you, Tokyo Tirana is just a visual part of artificial intelligence. Uh, I think artificial intelligence will even run a television by itself. So, for example, let's put something like this. Like, I have to make a television in 48 hours. So what should I do? I take an artificial intelligence, connect it with the Google News, and then I take the data from the Google News, feed it into a model like Tokyo Tirana, and make him, make him or her read the news, and then generate with artificial intelligence the pictures, and I go online in a YouTube channel live. And that can be done, I imagine, in a matter of seconds. So this yeah. competition for who breaks the story first, who's telling ah, the... This is another thing, because this... artificial intelligence can summarize the stories, mm -hmm. can, uh, can find what is inconsistent in a political speech, uh, can, can find <laughs> even the mind bullets, or maybe I should ask artificial intelligence, tell me what is interesting in what somebody is saying for the audience. And my audience type is this kind of person with this demography, this psychographics, and it will go exactly to find out what they like and what should I take out from this, the speech. As a journalist, like this is terrifying. Are we potentially at risk of losing our jobs? I don't Not think right so. Not right now. I mean, but mm. you, what you're saying, you know, is this AI can do in a matter of seconds something that an entire team of people need hours, days Yes, it will facilitate their job. It's like uh, you, we cannot say that we should not have more mathematicians because we invented the calculator. Mm -hmm. So some stuff that are being done by AI will be done by it and not by you as a journalist. You just will have an easier job to do. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to worry about Tokyo coming into my Absolutely studio not. anytime soon. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, what about in social media and other forms of media? Um, music, for example, I've, I've read about AI being used to generate music sound that sounds like existing singers and the same in films as well that can be AI can be used to create a film that say Brad Pitt and it looks like Brad Pitt talks like Brad Pitt acts like Brad Pitt of course but is not Brad Pitt yeah this is this yeah. is this has big implications so we we have the, the the voice part and the video part you know and actually there are companies in, in Hollywood that we got a strike in Hollywood uh, same time before about exactly for for this issue because like uh, I can photograph you in like uh, 300 degrees and I tell to artificial intelligence that this is the model. Now make this model do this, this, this and that. Uh -huh. And replace the background and make it talk, make it say it like this. In a movie I was checking out artificial intelligence. They even change what the actor says after the shooting and make it talk into another language. Mm -hmm. So for example, if the movie was shot in English and then 
should be run in the Spanish language. They even moved the lips like wow. she was talking in Spanish no. and even the facial expression. This is great from a creative point of view. I mean, the possibilities and appear to be endless, but there are concerns as well. Um, I was following a story recently about the Slovak elections, which took place last Saturday. Yeah. And there were videos posted on YouTube and Facebook that had used AI to create videos of um, a politician from the progressive Slovakia party saying things that he didn't say that would make him unpopular with voters. I believe one of them was something to do with raising the cost of the price of beer, which would hurt Czech people quite a lot, um, Slovak people quite a lot. So this was a big issue, um, if, especially in the context of elections. If you have AI pushing disinformation, which is something we're already struggling with in the media. And now we have this tool that can make people look like they're saying things, doing things that they're not doing. How do we combat this? I don't think we should combat that. I think it's uh, something that AIs or artificial intelligence didn't bring it on. This was already. But it's and making it worse, more dangerous. Yes, this m should make people more skeptical about what they hear and what they believe and what they see and to pay attention on what they actions are and what other people actions are. So, I mean, uh, artificial intelligence won't replace a human being at the moment which is talking. So after talking, then, OK, it's something that the media already does. So, I mean, I'm saying something and already in the editing room, they can fix like I'm saying someone some, something else. So but AI is just making it easier. Let me let me this make a idea. hypothetical scenario. Yeah. Um, using the technology that is available at the moment, there you could make a video of me. Um, I, I I don't want to give an inappropriate anyway. example, but saying something yeah. terrible. Yeah. You know, like cats are horrible, kill them all, and choosing the safest option yeah, yeah, possible. I, okay, I got it. And this would go all over YouTube, and it yeah. would look like me, sound like me, but yeah. I haven't said it track it down, put them person into cart. So, I mean, if I have, if, 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 uh, if I have to, to fix something with a computer and I do something wrong with my computer, that doesn't mean I should not have a computer. No, no, yeah. I agree. I guess my, my question is more how we prepare ourselves for the, the challenges democratically. These challenges could be fixed also by artificial intelligence tools, which can detect other artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that make the deep fakes. So, I mean, this is the only thing we can spot out because mm -hmm. it will be very difficult for a human being with yes. an average intelligence or a low intelligence to detect uh, a fake yes. video. Because these kind of videos, you know, the, they could be used for anything and this can put people's lives in danger. It yeah. can change the course of an election. It could change the course of a war. You know, it has At, very real implications. Yes. To me, it's OK, because this phase, I think, has passed because now People around me, I notice them, they say, ah, this must be fake. Ah, this must mm, be fake. People are more cynical. Yeah. So this makes them reason more and not take for granted everything that they see. So what's next? We have Tokyo Tirana reading the news. Um, are there any other plans for her to take over more or not take over literally, um, but to do more or to integrate AI into other areas of our work here? I think uh, it will be integrated in uh, slow piece and uh, with security. And Portion. so, yeah. So I think it's the way to go. And uh, people will mm. are working here will, will, will have more uh, tools in their disposal to do better work. Yes, this is what I, I mean. I am very cautious with the AI, but I yeah. do appreciate how it will free up time and help us be able to do the other thing. Yeah, I often can, say, I often say, I wish I had a clone, you know? Um, yeah, you, and but now you I could. can, you can, yeah, you can. Like, it's like, you God can, help us. you can, you can, you can test the, a clone. Yeah, it's not a problem. That one. Are they at the stage of being able to clean my house, do my invoicing, pay my bills yet? Or are we not there yet? Everything that can be, ah, this is a nice problem. <laughs> so, I mean, is I, I call it the the coffee favor problem. So, I mean, if I ask a friend of mine to bring me a coffee and uh, that person will bring me coffee, it will be different if I ask artificial intelligence to bring the coffee mm -hmm. because artificial intelligence and my friend can go into a shop where the coffee may cost about $20, which is a lot. And my friend will say, are you sure about that? 
<laughs> but artificial intelligence will bring you coffee. You just do it. No <laughs> questions <laughs> asked. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to be very specific about uh, about it. Jerome, thank you very much for your for your explanations and your time. And um, yes, I look, look forward to having you in the studio again. Thank you. <laughs> That's it for this week. Don't forget, you can tune into Inside Albania every Saturday, five o'clock on Euronews Albania, on our YouTube channel or across all major podcasting platforms. Miro Pafsim.